Chickamauga and Chattanooga National Military Park historian Jim Ogden stands front facing in uniform of a tan flat hat, gray shirt, and green trousers. He is standing in a wooded area. Welcome back. For many of you all, you're rejoining us after um, some of our earlier programs um, yesterday and today to recognize uh, virtually this year the 157th anniversary of the Battle of Chickamauga. Um, the, this year, as noted earlier, the actual days of the, uh, the week align as they did in um, 1863. And so we once again um, have the, uh, the battle action falling on Friday the 18th, Saturday the 19th, and Sunday the 20th. We've come down the um, developing battle line as it um, unfolds on September the 19th now from where the, uh, the fighting had begun on the morning of the 19th near um, Jay's Mill and, um, and Reed's Bridge. And we now um, are, are further south along this um, uh, developing battle line, um, a, um, a, a battle line that, uh, of a battle that was decidedly different than the one that Braxton Bragg expected. Bragg had still hoped on the morning of the 19th that the Union left flank would be at Lee and Gordon's Mill to the south from here, about three miles, um, and that he could still strike that Union left flank with the troops who had crossed the creek the day before, reinforced by um, the division of Benjamin Franklin Cheatham, and resume his effort to roll the Union Army up and drive it into McLemore's Cove. But one thing a military commander must always remember is if you do something to, um, to your enemy, your enemy is likely to react in some way. And William Stark Rosecrans um, had indeed, um, by marching George Thomas's 14th Corps troops across the rear of Tom Crittenden's 21st Corps late on the 18th and through, and, and through the early morning hours of the 19th, um, extending the Union left flank further to the north and essentially offsetting the move that Bragg had made the day before, and that it set the stage then uh, for George Thomas to learn of the intelligence of a supposed Confederate brigade near Jay's Mill and Reed's Bridge, and he'd sent Brannan's division out to try to capture that force. And what we know of commonly is the Battle of Chickamauga of September 19th and 20th began to unfold, and as each hour passed, and both sides committed more troops, in general marching those troops up from the south, and then for the Confederates turning them westward um, into the, um, uh, the action, and for the Union marching them from the south and turning them eastward. A battle line begins to develop that will flow south during the course of the day um, as each side commits one division after another to the fight. Most of that fight on September the 19th is going to unfold in a wooded or forested environment. And it is the woods of the valley of West Chickamauga Creek that gives the Battle of Chickamauga one of its most unique characters. The soldiers often describe the woods um, uh, as being um, choked with, um, with thick underbrush. But then as you read the accounts and you talk um, or read the reports of the officers and you see the talk of the troops maneuvering um, in their, um, their formations, if you look into the woods of Chickamauga today at most places, you wonder how the heck they ever maneuvered down through those woods. But the woods of Chickamauga in 1863 were very different than what you see on most places of the Chickamauga Battlefield Unit of the National Military Park today. As a result of the presence of a wildfire in the, um, in the environment, both naturally caused wildfires and also ones that um, uh, were, were created by uh, farmers using fire to, uh, to clear their, um, their fields, uh, fire helped keep the underbrush down in the woods. Additionally, the agricultural practice in most of this region, and in fact in most of the United States, was still one of open range for livestock. Farmers fenced their crops in, in the field, and in, um, in this region, most commonly, it was a, um, 
uh, a stacked rail um, fence, a split rail fence um, uh, that was by Georgia law five feet high. The fence had to be cow high and hog tight to be able to keep your and your neighbor's livestock out of your crop within the fenced in field. The law was so specific about the nature of the, uh, the fence uh, because if you expected to receive any compensation from your neighbor for damage done to your crop by his livestock. You had to prove to a jury of your peers um, who were called by the local county official um, that you had maintained a stout and proper or cow high and hog tight fence. The livestock branded and occasionally um, uh, rounded up for husbandry purposes were then turned loose to eat the, um, the low-growing and low-hanging vegetation in the forest and also in the unfenced um, areas around the actual cultivated fields. And as a result of hundreds, thousands of head of livestock roaming the countryside, eating the low-growing and low-hanging vegetation, the, it created a, uh, along with fire, a very open understory um, environment in the woods where you could see 150 or 200 yards down through the woods in most places. Now that 150 or 200 yard visibility sounds great for an individual soldier, and indeed it would be. However, when a Civil War period weapon is fired, that potassium nitrate based um, uh, black powder produces a great deal of smoke. And when hundreds of weapons are fired dozens of times in a small area, the overhead forest cover traps and holds that smoke in. And, and, and a, a visibility, which might initially has been, had been a much, as much as 200 yards down through the woods, quickly could be reduced to as little as 10 or 30 or 20 yards. And this is what makes the Battle of Chickamauga in so many ways remarkable to the participants of the battle. It unfolds at a very short range. Most of the engagements begin with um, uh, the, the, the contest or the combatants um, at less than 200 yards distance from one another. Typically it is first their skirmish lines that engage and as one side some skirmish line pushes back the other then the two main battle lines will close to within that 200 yards distance and begin firing as well. And most of these soldiers have experienced battle before and they recognize that the trees offer opportunities as well. And soldiers begin to take shelter behind the trees. And the nice, neat battle formations then begin to, um, to break up. Um, but cohesion retain, re, is retained in most of these units. And the fight will, um, will go on for some time at this relatively um, uh, short range in this increasingly smoky, limited visibility environment one that is very difficult for leaders to control. We stand along the uh, line that develops on September the uh, 19th as the, the fighting unfolds um, here in the woods and occasional fields of the valley of West Chickamauga Creek. The area where we stand now um, is a, a piece of the mostly hardwood forest that's um, fairly healthy and as a result the understory at this point is, um, is less than it is on many parts of the battlefield. And you can see here 80 or 100 yards um, into the woods and start to get some sense of the nature of the forest in 1863. This is a battle that largely unfolds in that wooded or forested environment, but it was a wooded or forested environment at the time that was dif very different than the one that you can see today. And, uh, as noted initially, you could see 150 or 200 yards down through the woods, but that visibility quickly uh, diminished as the overhead forest cover trapped and held the smoke of the discharge of all of the weapons um, repeatedly in a given area um, in. Where we are um, right now is an area just north of the Brock field. In fact, the Brocks were extending their field into this area 
um, and they would have used fire as they um, uh, cleared um, uh, an area for cultivation and also cleared the debris from the previous year's crop. And fire running down through the, uh, through the forest helped keep the, uh, the understory open. That uh, more open forest uh, nature at the time is also what allowed these units, the soldiers initially formed in the two ranks, elbowed um, with the, the assuring touch of elbows, um, to allow these long battle lines to move generally down through the woods in some order. But as the fighting began, the soldiers would take advantage of the nearby trees and the nice neat battle lines would um, deteriorate to some, or to some degree. But these soldiers being veterans would generally stay on the lines. The more open nature of the forest also allowed the artillery to accompany the infantry unit to which they were attached in most places and make it down through the woods as well. Today, as you visit the Chickamauga battlefield and you hike some of the trails, you might find it difficult to understand exactly how the artillery might have wound up where it did, uh, given how, uh, how little um, uh, visibility there is down through the woods, how much um, underbrush and understory there, uh, there is. Uh, another reason today why the woods of Chickamauga do not have the same character as they did in 1863 is that today we have some plants growing here which were not here at the time, in particular Chinese privet, an exotic invasive um, that now chokes the forest in, um, in many areas and which is a target of some of our efforts in helping to um, maintain um, and in some places even restore the, um, the, the battlefield. Fire is a, a, a feature of this battlefield as well during the battle itself. The uh, Battle of Chickamauga occurs um, after about a, a year-long drought throughout much of the southeast. There's been little or no rain whatsoever in the last um, uh, six weeks before the battle. The, uh, it has been so dry that the soldiers moving on the, uh, the dirt roads has ground the surface into a fine powdery dust. Uh, that dust, um, uh, as the troops move, driven into the air, um, creating telltale signatures of the movement of significant bodies of troops. But that dry weather had also left the forest tinder dry. And the black powder, the propellant of the, uh, the day, uh, burns relatively slowly in comparison to modern um, uh, propellants and as the weapons are fired, some only partially uh, consumed grains of powder um, are spewed from the muzzles of the weapons and onto the ground and very often they could cause a fire to, um, to break out. Here in the area of the Brock Field, the, um, uh, the fighting will set the, uh, the field on fire, and by night, some of the dead standing trees that were still in the Brock Field have caught fire as well. Um, those trees, um, having been girdled long ago and are now standing rotting away, um, had hollowed out. And one observer said that um, it appeared as if Roman candles were being um, fired in the, uh, the Brock Field. The um, air going up those hollow trees, carrying embers out of the top of the tree into the darkness. On another part of the, uh, the battlefield, the fire set um, uh, the, uh, the vegetation on, um, on fire as well. Um, a correspondent of the Columbus, Georgia Enquirer would, uh, would write, I have been on several battlefields and have read many descriptions of them, but none that I have ever seen or read of can compare with that of Chickamauga. During the fiercest of the, fiercest of the fighting on Saturday evening, where our division, Stewart's division, was engaged, the woods took fire and the fire spread rapidly. The killed and wounded suffered from its terrible effects alike. 
It was enough to make one heart, one's heart bleed to witness the agony, agonies of our wounded comrades as they laid upon their backs, utterly powerless to help themselves, while the consuming element held, had fast hold on some and was rapidly approaching others. One of um, the things that a visit to the area of Brock Field also allows you to do is to get some sense of the battle line as it develops and extends south and also just the scale of um, uh, the fighting that was occurring um, on that day. When the veterans created the National Military Park in the 1890s, they envisioned returning the forest to that um, open nature of 1863. And that's something that has not um, been able to be, uh, be retained. And so today, with the limited visibility through the woods, it is sometimes um, difficult to get some idea about the scale of some of these units that were involved. But here in the area of Brockfield, if you park in the, um, in the parking spaces there at the intersection of Alexander Bridge Road and Brotherton Road, and then go for a short walk, you can get some idea of just the magnitude, um, the size, the space covered by some of these units. The Confederate Division of Benjamin Franklin Cheatham, five brigades fighting with um, a, three of the brigades in the front line, um, and two brigades in reserve to be rotated in as needed, that division's front was more than a mile. If you start there at those parking spaces at Alexander Bridge and Brotherton Road, uh, Cheatham's right flank, initially the um, Georgia and Mississippi Brigade of John K. Jackson extended onto that um, uh, parking space side or the uh, east or north side of Alexander Bridge Road there. And then if you walk um, south, southwestward on Brotherton Road towards Brock Field, and then across Brock Field itself and go into the woods on the trail leading southwestward from Brock Field, you will walk across nearly the entire miles frontage of Cheatham's division. It's one of the places where you can get some sense of the size of one of these units frontage um, and have a, um, a viable path um, to walk on, particularly this time of the year when the vegetation is still up. In Brock Field itself, you can see the battle lines marked. And as the fighting surged into the area of the Brock's um, farmstead, the fight will surge back and forth into and out of the Brock Field um, for a time. And as you look across the Brock Field, you can see the two lines of, um, of or the monuments uh, marking the battle lines of the two sides um, almost literally on the same ground. Generally, as you look across the field, the larger monuments are those of the Union lines. In particular, the units, um, or commemorating the units of William B. Hazen's brigade, John Palmer's um, uh, brigade, his left front brigade in the advance into this area. And the smaller monuments, sometimes depending upon the, uh, the height of the grass in the field and, um, and when the farmer last cut the, uh, the grass for hay, um, are Tennessee monuments to um, Tennessee regiments of both Preston Smith's and Otho Strahl's brigades that fought one after another in that part of Brock Field. This fight of the afternoon of September the 19th, 1863, is one that surges back and forth through the woods and occasional fields here ever further southwestward. And it makes that fighting, particularly of the afternoon, just a part of the giant meeting engagement, the two armies coming together here in this costly battle that uh, will give truth by its end to the already existing nickname of West Chickamauga Creek, the River of Death. Chickamauga and Chattanooga National Military Park historian Jim Ogden stands front facing in uniform of a tan flat hat, gray shirt and green trousers. He stands in a grassy field with some grass still being tall and other areas being mowed. In the distance 
is a row of trees. To his right is a rock-faced stone monument. We are now here in Brock Field. The, um, the Brock um, farmstead, uh, the buildings uh, stood in the, um, in the trees just um, a little bit to the southwest of where we are now on kind of the western edge of the field. The field at the time of the battle in 1863 extended um, uh, almost the same distance to the south through a thin strip of trees that ran um, east and west across the, uh, what was essentially then the middle of the field. And the Brocks were also in the process of clearing additional um, acreage to the, uh, to the north of the Brotherton Road. Um, in fact, uh, participants on both sides would note the felled trees. Um, and it is possible that um, since there were um, uh, descriptions of felled trees, not just girdled trees, typically the way that a farmer would clear an area, it is possible, therefore, that um, trees were being harvested um, and the saw logs taken the roughly miles distance to the northeast um, to, um, uh, to Jay's Mill. Um, but as noted, one of the things that you can see here in Brock Field is a representation of the battle line as it continues to develop further to the southwest. If you walk down from the intersection of Alexander Bridge Road and Brotherton Road um, and the parking spaces there, you, uh, you will begin um, near the right flank of Jackson's Brigade of Cheatham's Division. And as you walk along Brotherton Road, you walk um, along the length of the front of Jackson's Brigade as it moves up from the southeast um, towards the northwest. Um, and then um, as you come to, um, to, to Brock Field, you can look out into the field. And the first Union troops engaged in this area are those of John Palmer's division, and in particular, um, the brigade commanded by William B. Hazen. Those troops of Tom Crittenden's 21st Corps had been positioned down at Lee and Gordon's Mill, but now as this fight is developing, Rosecrans orders Palmer's division to be marched north. Fearful that the Lafayette Road was not fully usable um, any longer, Palmer had actually diverged um, to the west as he had come north, and this took his division um, and himself by Rosecrans recently established headquarters at the Widow Glens, the site of the Wilder Brigade Monument today. And there, Rosecrans, um, receiving reports from Thomas and others about the developing battle and how um, the southern flanks of the units that had already been engaged, uh, particularly Baird's division, had been threatened by the approach of Confederates from the south. Rosecrans suggested first to Hazen and then to Palmer himself that Palmer um, deploy his division not in the standard um, the deployment formation based on Casey's tactics that the Army of the Cumberland was then using uh, within a division, two brigades up and one brigade back in reserve, but instead for Palmer to deploy his division in echelon by brigade each brigade, um, uh, or uh, uh, one brigade um, in the left front, and the other two brigades stair-stepped off to the right rear, um, so as to potentially offer protection to the right flank of the unit in the lead. And Palmer's men had marched on um, to the Lafayette Road in the area of the Poe Farm, parked their um, ammunition wagons um, there at that point, and Hazen had then deployed his four regiments in two lines, two up and two back, and moved them eastward into the woods, guiding on the sound of the fight between Richard Johnson's division and some of um, Cheatham's troops already. Um, as they move into this area, Hazen's brigade will be become engaged with Confederates of Preston Smith's brigade of Cheatham's division, the middle of Cheatham's three frontline brigades. Um, and a stand-up fight will, um, uh, will develop 
between Hazen's two lead regiments um, and some of um, Smith's men. And as uh, Hazen's men consume the ammunition in their cartridge box and their pockets, those two lead regiments are relieved by the other two. Um, and um, ev eventually, they will have to be, uh, be replaced by other troops entirely. And during the course of the afternoon, through this um, uh, process of, um, uh, of relief and advance and repositioning, the, uh, the fighting will um, surge out here into the Brock Field. And that is represented by the line of commemorative features here today. The two battle lines almost on the same ground with one another, not from the exact same moment in time, but reflecting the advance and withdrawal of the units at different times. The taller monuments, beginning with the Indiana marker um, immediately here to my right, um, and then the two larger ones represent units of Hazen's brigade. The smaller market marker, just barely visible, rising um, from, the, uh, from the grass, represent Tennessee units of first Preston Smith's brigade and then Strahl's brigade. Indeed, as the, uh, the fight unfolded here, Hazen's right flank, his southern flank, was threatened by the approach of Confederates, not coming up um, uh, exactly um, in line with, uh, with Jackson's brigade. And the 2nd Brigade in Palmer's division, Cruft's brigade, will deploy, um, facing more off to the, um, uh, to the southeast um, as they deploy, their line bending back, reaching back towards the Lafayette Road, and when Palmer's 3rd Brigade, Gross's Brigade, comes up, their line will be deployed facing essentially south, the line getting bent back here along the front of Cheatham's large division. And um, as noted earlier, you can walk the, uh, this battle line essentially by coming um, down the Brotherton Road from the intersection of Brotherton Road and Alexander Bridge Road, and then out here into Brockfield, along the line of the monuments of Hazen's Brigade, and then off to the southwest to go into the woods, past some of the commemorative features for um, uh, Cross Brigade and Gross's Brigade, and the, cont and the continuation of Cheatham's Division, particularly the right of uh, Marcus Wright's Brigade. The battle moves south um, through the woods and the occasional fields, as both sides commit division after division to the action. Pictures shown in this video are described as follows. Image number one, a black and white photo of Union General William Stark Rosecrans from the shoulder up with body slightly turned with dark hair and full dark beard wearing dark blue Union General's coat with two stars of a major general insignia on the shoulder and two rows of brass buttons down the front. Image number two, video panning from right to left of a split rail wooden fence. There are eight rails stacked on top of one another, making the fence approximately five feet high. The fence is laid out in a zigzag pattern. Image number three, Alfred R. Wode, W-A-U-D, drawing on tan paper in the medium of Chinese white and black ink wash, depicting Confederate line advancing through forest toward Union troops. Image number four, a color photo of a group of trees in a field that have been girdled a strip of bark has been completely removed from around the entire circumference of the trunk approximately three feet from the ground. Image number five, video panning from right to left showing a parking lot with cars parked in spaces and then the intersection of two roads. Image number six, 
black and white photo of Confederate General Benjamin Franklin Cheatham seated, forwards facing, but slightly turned, with dark hair combed to the side and full dark mustache, wearing a light gray Confederate General's coat with General's insignia of three stars within a wreath on the collar and two rows of brass buttons unbuttoned, and a light-colored vest with a single row of brass buttons buttoned down the front. Image number seven, the inside cover of a manual that reads, By Authority, Infantry Tactics for the Instruction, Exercise, and Maneuvers of the Soldier, a Company, Line of Skirmishers, or Corps d'Armée, by Brigadier General Silas Casey, U.S. Army, Volume 1, New York, D. Van Nostrand, 152 Broadway, 1863.